Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Maxwell House Coffee presents Good News of 1938. The makers of Maxwell House Coffee from the Metro Golden Mayor Studios invite you to be their guest for the next 59 minutes on Sound Stage 30 here in Hollywood. Tonight, we welcome back your host, Robert Taylor. <laughs> thanks, Ted, and thanks, everybody. It's good to be back home. I mean, back on the program. It looks like I've stepped right into the middle of one of the grandest shows we've ever had. Our guest list has all the earmarks of a who's who in Hollywood and is headed by the guiding genius of our movie alma mater, Mr. Louis B. Mayer. You'll also meet Una Merkel, Lionel Barrymore, Maureen O'Sullivan, Jack Conway, Gilbert Russell, Fanny Bryce, Frank Morgan, Connie Boswell, Hanley Stafford, and Meredith Wilson's orchestra, who get the show underway right now with a grand tune, I Love to Whistle. Take it away, Meredith. <laughs> It's good to see you again. <laughs> I've been wanting to see you, Frank. Yes, to compliment me on the fine job I did for you last week, I suppose. <laughs> Confidentially, Bob, how was I as master of ceremonies? I've never heard such a masterpiece of incoherency. Well, thank you. You possibly uh, reached a new high. Really? You flatter me, Bob. A new high and what? Boredom. Well, that's... Uh, what? What? Are you... That's a fine way to talk after the way I stuck up for you last week. I listened to the program, and you just about ruined me last week. Well, I... I what kind of a set were you listening on? <laughs> you know, you can't trust some of those radios. I had one once, and believe me, I was afraid to turn my back on it. <laughs> the radio was all right, Frank. It was you. I'd know your voice anywhere. Well, now, don't be too sure, Bob. You know, I used to be known as the man of a thousand voices. <laughs> In fact, I was the first ventriloquist on radio, back in the days when everybody said you couldn't put a dummy on the air. <laughs> you showed him, huh? I certainly... D I... What? Bob, if we weren't such good pals, I'd take that as an insult. Yeah, never no, mind I... that pal stuff. Getting back to last week's program, what was that about me cheating at cards? Who said that? I'll knock his block off, saying my buddy Bob Taylor cheated at cards. Just tell me who he is, that's all. You, you said it. 
Certainly I... No. I never said you cheated at cards. All I said was that when we played poker at your house, from the minute your butler took the mirror down that was hanging in back of me, you started losing. <laughs> Why, Bob, I said nothing but nice things about you. You must have been listening to Meredith Wilson. He was... What's Crab is... Well, if it isn't Wilson, <laughs> my pal. Oh, so you're going to give me that my pal business, too? Well, right? certainly, Wilson. You know what I think of you. Well, I don't like you either. <laughs> well, there you are. You see, <laughs> they write the whole thing wrong. That Wilson <laughs> is always kidding. Why, Bob, he and I have been friends for years. There isn't anything I wouldn't try to do to uh, out, of, out of... I mean... Well, I'll see you later, fellas. I have to telephone home. It's the children's night out, and I want to see if the maid is all right. <laughs> Too bad this program isn't on tomorrow, Bob. You know, we could dedicate the whole show to Morgan. Yeah, why tomorrow? Well, it's April Fool's Day. <laughs> now, uh, uh, where were we before Morgan interrupted us? Well, we were about to have Connie Boswell sing a special arrangement of Gypsy in My Soul, weren't we? Uh, yeah, I think we were. And uh, speaking of the Boswell, here she is. <laughs> Hello, Connie. How's the head lady in our singing department this evening? Ran to go, Colonel T. Ran to go. I guess you know you're doing my favorite song tonight. Gypsy in My Soul? Mm -hmm. Well, if that's your favorite, Colonel, that makes me double ran. Gypsy music, please, Martha Wilson. If I am fancy free and love to wonder, it's just a gypsy in my soul. There's something calling me from way out yonder. It's just a gypsy in my soul. I've got to give them to my emotion. I'm only content having my way. There is no other life of which I'm fonder. It's just a gypsy in my soul. No fear, no shame. Love to wonder, it's just a gypsy in my soul. If I am fancy free and love to wonder, it's just a gypsy in my soul. There's something calling me from way out yonder, it's just a gypsy in my soul. I've got to give them to my emotion. I'm only content. I'm only content when I'm having my way. There is no other life of which I'm fond of. It's just a gypsy in my soul. No care, no thing. My little heart has wings. If I am fancy free, I love to wander. It's just a gypsy in my soul. There comes a time in every father's life when he must take his offspring to see the circus. Well, the circus is here, and so is Baby Snook, accompanied by her father, played by Hanley Stafford. Enter Fanny Bryce as Baby Snook. Well, Snooks, here we are at the circus. Now, remember, I don't want you to go too close to the animal cages. I won't, Daddy. Now, wait a minute. I have to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. Hey, you are, mister. Uh, just a minute there, buddy. You'll have to pay for the little girl, too. But that time says children under seven admitted free. Is uh, she under seven? She looks older. Well, she isn't, and I ought to know I'm her father. Yeah? How old are you, little girl? Huh? Tell the man your age, Snook. Ninety-eight. <laughs> oh, stop that nonsense. You know you're only six years old. Never mind coaching the child, mister. 
Let her tell me how old she is herself. I want to go inside the circus. Well, tell the man you're under seven and then we can go in. Is this a streetcar, Daddy? Oh, no. So why can't I tell the truth? Come on, we're going home. Keep gate. Now, you look here. Ah! Oh, stop here. I'll give you a licking. I want to go inside the circus. Well, tell the man how old you are. Ah, stop all that beefing and buy the kid a ticket. I will not. It's not the 50 cents, it's uh, the, the principle of the thing. She knows she's only six years old. Well, if she says so herself, I'll let her in for nothing. Go ahead, Snoops. Say I'm six years old. Huh? Say to the man, I'm six years old. Daddy is six years old. Oh, never mind. Here's the 50 cents. Come on. How come going, Daddy? Yes. Daddy. What? Is the man going to eat the half a dollar? Oh, no. Then why did he bite it? It was an insulting gesture. He wanted to see if the money was good. Is it good, Daddy? Why, of course it's good. Then why didn't he eat it? Oh, stop that. I brought you to the circus. Now enjoy yourself, you little devil. <laughs> All right. What's that funny thing in the cage? It's a blue-nosed baboon. Oh. I thought it was Uncle Louis. <laughs> no, it's not Uncle Louis. It's a monkey. It looks like Uncle Louie. Well, what if it does? You shouldn't say those unkind things. Why? Because it's not nice to compare a monkey with Uncle Louie. Can the monkey understand me? Oh, come away from there. Let's go in and see the show. I don't want it. Well, where do you want to go first? I want to go home. You can't go home. You pestered me all week to take you to the circus. Now enjoy the animals. All right, Daddy. Oh, look. What is it now? Uncle Louie, you I told you it's not, Uncle Louie. Come away from that cage. I'll hear some birds. What kind of birds, Daddy? A wild duck. Now, look at that one swimming around. See its pretty plumage? What's plumage, Daddy? It's feathers. Down. The duck's whole coat is down. Is his pants down, too? No, no. Oh, forget about the duck. Now, look at the big elephant. Oh. Daddy. What? Look what that elephant is doing. Well, what's he doing? He's eating peanuts with his tail. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. That's his tongue. Well, where's his tail? In the back. In the back of the trunk? <laughs> no, in the back of the elephant. Why? Because that's where it belongs. The tail is in the back and the trunk is in front. It's really the elephant's nose. But he's putting it in his mouth. Well, what's so wonderful about that? Can you do it? Snooks, <laughs> you're giving me a headache with your silly questions. Come on now, let's take a fast look around and go home. Ain't you gonna buy me something, Daddy? All right, what do you want? I'm asking you, what do you want? A balloon? No. You want a cane? No. Some peanuts? No. Well, what do you want? I want a balloon. Oh, all right. The balloon man is way back there by the monkey cage. Come on. Can I have a big one, Daddy? You'll take the regular size. Say, mister, let me have a balloon. I want peanuts, too. Well, give us some peanuts, too. Well, thanks. Here you are. Now, are you satisfied? Uh-huh. Daddy. And now what is it? Make the balloon bigger. Oh, all right. I'll blow it up. Give it to me. <laughs> bigger. <laughs> bigger. <laughs> it can't go any bigger. And don't stand so close to that cage. All right, but stop yelling. <laughs> now look, you see that? It's burst. Don't stop crying, I'll buy you another balloon. I don't want another balloon. And what are you crying for? Uncle Louie grabbed my peanut. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you now to participate in a celebration marking an important milestone in the progress of entertainment throughout the world. The first international premiere in the history of motion pictures. It's now a little after two o'clock in the morning in England. A distinguished audience sitting in London's famous Empire Theater has just seen the first English showing of Metro-Golden-Mayer's first English production, A Yank at Oxford. Our program is now being transmitted to that audience in London by shortwave radio so that they, as well as you yourself, will hear greetings from Mr. Louis B. Mayer, MGM production chief, who will address the audience in London. Mr. Mayer. Your Excellency, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it is with genuine pride that I send my humble voice across the breadth of the United States and expanse of the Atlantic Ocean to greet you upon this occasion. I am proud because tonight's London premiere of A Yank at Oxford marks another important step in the development of the motion picture industry in England an industry in whose growth and welfare I have long been deeply interested. In producing this fine picture in England, the first in an impressive schedule of production, our company has, I believe, contributed vastly to the international appreciation and exchange of popular entertainment. Here in America, I am happy to say, a Yank at Oxford has won the hearts of audiences everywhere. We sincerely hope England may find it equally enjoyable. The hour is late in London, although it is not yet the dinner hour here in Hollywood. And I know that you have been kind enough to remain in your seats at the Empire Theatre must be growing tired. So without more ado, I wish to introduce to you some of the American members of the cast who appear in the picture you have just seen. First, it is my honor to present a distinguished and beloved artist, one of America's greatest, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My friends in England, I may truthfully say that I wish I were with you tonight. Uh, I believe it was the poet Robert Browning who said, Oh, to be in England now that April's there. And it just occurred to me that April's already two hours old in London while here it's only the 31st of March. <laughs> of course, in Hollywood, March is just like April anyway, which would be all right, except that April is just like June. But sincerely, it was a real delight for me to revisit England for the filming of A Yank at Oxford, and I hope I may be permitted to return again in the near future. Uh, what about that, Mr. Mayor? Lionel, that's what I call a subtle hint. The only difficulty is that everyone wants to go, but I'll keep your request in mind. And now let me introduce the charming and clever Maureen O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Would it be wrong for me to say hello to my mother and father who are listening in at our home in Ireland? Well, now that you've said it, I guess nobody can object. <laughs> I'd also like to tell them to be sure and see our picture, but perhaps I'd better not. No, Maureen, you better not. Well, then I would just like to say hello to the friends... And the many friends that I met, met while we were making the picture in England, and I hope that I may soon have a chance to welcome them here in Hollywood. I also hope you'll have that opportunity, Maureen. Now, I wish to present a gentleman who is one of the screen's greatest directors, Mr. Jack Conway. Those are kind words, Mr. Mayor, and I thank you. But I hasten to say that whatever success I had in directing a Yank at Oxford was due in a large measure to the wholehearted cooperation we received from our English cast and from the English production staff and technicians. The success our picture has already achieved proves, I believe, that entertainment knows no international boundaries. And I'm convinced that through similar exchange of creative talents and efforts, England and America may profit mutually. Again, to our English co-workers, my deep and sincere appreciation. And now I want to present a young man who has even more reason to be grateful to you, Mr. Conway, than I have myself. The young man we sent to England with you as the star of a Yank at Oxford, Robert Taylor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I do owe Jack Conway a debt of gratitude. I don't think I've ever enjoyed myself more than I did with him in England. Bob, will you ever forget that amazing reception when you landed? <laughs> oh, I'll never forget it. What I remember most right this minute, however, is the steaks at the Lord Belgrave. I certainly would like to wade into one of them for dinner tonight. 
Yes, we had lots of fun over there. Remember the time the boys threw you in the river that day we were shooting the boat scene? I certainly do. It was cold to begin with, and the river was only three feet deep, and I landed right on my head in the mud. What's this? Is... What's this? Is that what was going on over there? Uh, it was only in fun, Mr. Mayor. We played while we worked, so to speak, and it seemed to make the work go faster. A grand bunch of people, and like Mr. Barrymore, I can hardly wait to see them all again. I mean, I can hardly wait to see you all again. Thank you, Bob. It's been a great privilege for all of us to join in this international premiere, and particularly to the English cast, do we send our personal felicitations and greetings. <laughs> It is now my pleasure to present a young Englishman who you on the other side have heard often through the British Broadcasting Company. I heard him sing in England when I was there last summer, and he's under contract to us now here in Hollywood. His name is Gilbert Russell, though you knew him as Val Rosing. Gilbert is going to present now the song I first heard him sing, Jerome Kern's composition, The Way You Look Tonight. presume the real reason we choose one coffee over another is, well, flavor. But, Ted, you told me another reason the other day why so many choose Maxwell House. I, I believe you said it's one coffee that assures you not only full flavor, but full value in every pound. Yes, that's exactly what you do get in every pound of Maxwell House coffee. Full flavor, full value. Now, there are really two reasons for this. The first reason, Maxwell House coffee is offered in two different grinds to fit exactly your own method of coffee making. Well, I make drip coffee in my home, Mr. Cherson. So, of course, I use a special drip grind Maxwell House. And I must say, I do get a better cup of coffee always. Full flavor and full value, as you say. Naturally. And that goes for all of you who like drip coffee. But on the other hand, those of you who prefer percolator or boiled coffee will get the most value, the best cup of coffee, by using the regular grind Maxwell House. I think I know the second reason why Maxwell House coffee gives me full value. It's always fresh when I get it. And not merely days fresh, either, but roaster fresh. And no coffee can be fresher than that. You see, Maxwell House coffee is packed in that super vacuum can that keeps the air out and the flavor in, all of it. And this super vacuum can is the only device science has yet discovered 
to guarantee you absolutely roaster fresh coffee whenever and wherever you buy it. That's your final assurance of full flavor, full value for your money. And here's something. Thrifty housewives everywhere who use lots of coffee are discovering the convenience and added economy in buying the two-pound can. Meredith Wilson plays After You from Double or Nothing. comes a surprise visit from one of the screen's most charming young comedians, Miss Una Merkel. Well, thank you, honey. My, but you certainly do have a nice place here for your broadcast, and I never saw such a charming place. These lovely drapes and such good-looking boys and your orchestra and such shiny instruments and all those lovely microphones and everything. And the stage manner was just so sweet to me when I came in. It just reminded me of home. Honestly, it's all so nice. It just leaves me speechless. Yes, well, yeah. uh, yeah. Well, I'm not one for talking, Bob, but I, I just can't help asking you just one question. Why do you suppose all those lovely people applauded when I walked out here? Why did they applaud? Don't be so modest, Una. They applaud because you're Una Merkel, the picture actress. All that clapping just because I'm Una Merkel? Oh, certainly. Oh, shush, Bob Taylor. I bet you they'd clap just as hard if Greta Garbo walked out here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see you again, Una. I've missed you around a lot for the last few weeks. Where have you been? Well, I'm sort of in betwixt and between pictures right now, Bob. Oh, I see. Having a nice rest, huh? Uh-huh. Except that while I'm resting, I- I'm not exactly resting. You want to know a secret? Well, I'm doing a little magazine work in my spare time. Magazine work? You mean writing articles? Yes, isn't it really? I guess it is, yes. Are you being pretty successful? Well, I'm holding my own, Bob. By that, I mean I send the editors just as much as they send back. <laughs> well, you, you can't lose anything that way, can you? Well, that's what I really wanted to ask you about. I've written a little article about you. You have? You uh-huh. Mean? And I'd kind of like to get you okay on it, because then I could send the stuff right in. Well, I'd be glad to do anything I can, you know. Well, I guess I'd better read it to you, honey. It's called The Real Robert Taylor. <laughs> the Real Robert Taylor. That's very good. Oh, do you think so? Uh-huh. Well, here goes. The Real Robert Taylor by Una Merkel. When I arrived at the attractive home of Robert Taylor, the sun was streaming in through the patio. My whole body was tingling with a sensation of expectancy, and I can't ever remember feeling better in my life. <laughs> this grand feeling was partly due to the fact that I had arisen early on this bright, sunshiny morning, and all my favorite tall stallion wrecks had gone for a canter through the Hollywood Hills. After this glorious exercise, I returned to my home and slipped on a bathing suit for a refreshing plunge in my gorgeous tile pool. My appetite, Charles. Uh, excuse me, Una. Uh, just, what is it, honey? Uh, is this the article you're writing about me? Yes, the real Robert Taylor. <laughs> A real Robert Taylor. Well, go on. Go on. My appetite sharpened. I dashed into my kitchen and prepared the southern breakfast, which has made me the envy of every Hollywood hostess. <laughs> this breakfast consists of honest use, ham and eggs, toast, and coffee. Mm-hmm. Well, how's the article so far, Bob? Does it meet with your approval? Well, don't you think it's a little personal? Oh, Bob, no, no, no. They just love to read those little intimate things. They want to know the real you. Oh, yes, the real Robert Taylor. Well, you go right ahead. Now, let me hear the rest of it. So naturally, when I arrived at Robert Taylor's house, I was in very good spirits. 
Before ringing the doorbell, I glanced at myself in the small mirror of my handbag, which is one of those new alligator scaparelli models, very stylish. <laughs> and I noted the high color in my cheeks. I thought I looked very becoming in my new white fox fur piece. On leaving the house that morning, I decided that my white fox fur was the right thing to wear. Nothing else would do, absolutely nothing, so that's what I wore. Yeah, is that all? Oh, don't be silly. I had a dress on, too. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, let me see. Where was I? You were ringing the doorbell, the real Robert Taylor's doorbell. Oh, yes. Well, I rang the doorbell, and while waiting for somebody to answer, I glanced about the spacious grounds of Robert Taylor's Valley Home. Now we're getting somewhere. I was instantly struck by the strong resemblance of the place to the old colonial home where I was raised in Chattanooga. Uh, we're heading south again. When I was a child, we lived in a white frame mansion with my grandfather's table flanking the left wing. I can never erase the picture of grooms currying those high-strung horses. <laughs> you really caught my personality, Una. Go ahead, the real Robert Taylor. Yes. Oh, say, I forgot to tell you. This article will be illustrated with some lovely informal photographs. Oh, that's nice. Where did you get an informal photograph of me? Oh, they're not of you, Bob. They're pictures of me. As the uh, real Robert uh, was pictures of you. Oh, well, don't forget, darling. They were taken outside of your house. Oh, well, that's different. Oh, sure. Well, uh, let's hear the rest of this article. I'm awfully glad you're so interested. And your fans will just love this little peek at you behind the scenes. Behind the scenes? You've got me behind the eight ball. <laughs> yes, isn't it cute? Well, now let me finish. After I rang Mr. Taylor's doorbell, I waited for about ten minutes and nobody answered, so I climbed into my yellow roadster and headed for the tennis club. I thought a couple of sets of tennis would be just uh, what wait, I... Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, Junior. Don't you think you've got a little too much about me in that story? Oh, oh, don't you worry about that, Bob. They'll edit it. Oh, well, that's all right, then. They'll take care of that. Well, of course they will. What do you think of it, honestly, now, Bob? Well, I think it's wonderful. Do you know something, Eunice? What, honey? You've given me a real inspiration. I'm going to write my autobiography. The story of your life? Hmm. Well, that's grand, Bob. What are you going to call it? The real Una Merkel. <laughs> Ted, last week when I was shooting the final scenes of The Three Comrades, I still found time to hear good news. At about the time you were inviting everybody to have a cup of Maxwell House coffee, I was having my own cup of Maxwell House coffee with my dinner in the dressing room. And it uh, made me think of you all here. Well, Robert, we sure missed you, and we're mighty glad you're back. It's time right now for that same pleasant custom of ours, visit to the old Maxwell House for a steaming, fragrant cup of the coffee that boils you up and never lets you down. Swing along with us, Meredith. We pause now for station identification. This is KFI Los Angeles. I remember when I was a little gent long before Una Merkel became a fan magazine writer. A song wasn't a hit unless it stayed on top for a long time, at least a year or so. But lately, any song that survives after a couple of months has to be a real sensation, and there aren't many of them. One of the few that seem destined to live is Cole Porter's Night and Day. After having been bandied about for the past eight or nine years by orchestras and singers, it's still about 50 years ahead of its time. We hear it now in the very special Meredith Wilson style, Night and Day. Pick it up from there, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. 
Bob, I, uh, I was just thinking. Well, you got a novelty right there, Frank. Huh? <laughs> Thanks. I was just thinking that it's quite a coincidence you coming back on the program tonight of all nights. Why tonight? Why, it's Tchaikovsky's birthday. You mean Tchaikovsky the composer? No, 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 no. Tchaikovsky the flea. Tchaikovsky the flea? Yes, my little flea, my pal. Oh, he was a fine chap. One of the finest friends a fellow ever had. He was closer to me than a brother. We were just like that. Haven't I told you about him? No. Well, it's quite an interesting story, if you don't mind being bored. <laughs> After what's been going on around here tonight, I can stand anything. Well, it all dates back to the days when Morgan was in a circus. In a cage? Yes, I was... No. I... Well, anyway, we had a bunch of trained fleas with the circus, and Tchaikovsky was one of the trained fleas. One of the most intelligent animals you've ever seen. Without Tchaikovsky, Bozo, the talking dog, would have been a deaf mute. Tchaikovsky was the only flea in the troop who could bite hard enough to make Bozo talk. So Tchaikovsky was a big success. He never missed the cue. Yes, this is all true, of course. Well, you know Morgan's reputation for the truth. Yes, that's why I asked. Yes. Well, uh, one day we played in the same town with Uncle Tom's cabin show, and the manager of the show heard about Tchaikovsky's knack of cueing Bozo, so he came over and put him under contract to cue one of his bloodhounds, who was lazy and always forgetting to chase Eliza across the ice. Well, Tchaikovsky was an immediate success, and as the months went on, he became the official cure for all the bloodhounds. He'd sit on their backs holding the script, and when the cue came, <laughs> Tchaikovsky would start things moving. After a while, well, you know how lazy some actors are. Yeah, don't be so self-conscious, Frank. <laughs> yes. Well, soon little Eva, Topsy, Uncle Tom, and even Simon Legree started kicking. They wanted Tchaikovsky to bite them on their cues. <laughs> And, uh, and so it was arranged. Yes, night after night, he would go hopping from Uncle Tom to Little Eva and vice versa, never missing a cue. After a while, it got so all the actors depended solely on Little Tchaikovsky for their cues. And then, one night, yes, <sighs> one night Tchaikovsky got a little drunk and came to the theater without his script. He missed every cue. He caused a terrible mix-up, and the show was so bad they had to close it. Little Tchaikovsky was inconsolable. He felt terrible. He was the most melancholy flea you've ever seen. You understand, Bob. Well, never having been a melancholy flea myself, I wouldn't know. Yes, well, believe me, he was a mighty depressed little flea. For months, no one could cheer him up, not even me, his pal. 
He used to say, Morg, it just means something has gone out of me. I can't forget it. And it was true. That sparkle had gone out of his little eyes. His bites didn't have that old itch. Oh, How touchy. Well, finally, one day, in desperation, he said to me, Morg, I've decided to give up the stage. No, no, Chickoff, I said to him, not that. No, and what did Chickoff say? Well, he said, yes, I feel so bad, I think I'll go into pictures. So just to give him an idea what he was in for, I took him to a movie to see a picture of Rin Tin Tin. <laughs> well, so when Chikowsky saw Rin Tin Tin on the screen, his little flea heart fluttered. Once more, his nostrils filled with the irresistible smell of the grease paint, like an old fire horse. With an uncontrollable leap, he hopped up on the screen and started biting Rin Tin Tin. He bit and he bit and he bit, but naturally, being a screen, Rin Tin Tin couldn't feel it. Well, that was the last straw. Poor little Tchaikovsky was so broken-hearted that he limped back to me with a forsaken look in his eyes. He whispered, Morg, I'm a failure. And with that, little Tchaikovsky died in my arms. <laughs> Morgan? I don't believe a word of it. Well, it's the truth, so help me if it isn't. I hope to fall in a dead faint right on this spot. Oh! <laughs> Quick, the water, the water. Morgan's fainted. It's me again, Colonel Taylor. Well, who are you? I, I mean, <laughs> oh, Carney. I'm sorry, honey. You have to excuse me. Two minutes without Morgan, and I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, now, what's the name of your song again, then? I can dream, can't I? <laughs> we can listen, can't we? Sure enough, the Martha Wilson will play, will he? I sure will, won't I? I mean, uh, I will. <laughs> well, go ahead. Well, why don't you? And he did. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Bob. Bob, here, uh, here it is. It's all set. What are you talking about now, Frank? The sketch. I just received it from my nephew. Oh, now, no, wait a minute. Is this sketch from the same bright nephew who sent the one about Burlap Domes? Yes. He was so pleased with the way we acted, Burlap Domes, that he sat down and wrote this one. Here's, here's the letter he sends with it. All right, let's hear it. Dear Uncle Morg, I can't forget how my other sketch was performed by that Robert Taylor. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yes, but look the way he sells Bob. B O O B. <laughs> He's a cute kid. You'll love this sketch, Bob. Yeah, I'll bet I will. Well, forget the letter. What's the sketch about? Well, it's a little original he knocked off called Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. An original? Yes. Frank, did you ever hear of Robert Louis Stevenson? Oh, yes. I know all three of them. What are they doing now? <laughs> Well, let it go. So your nephew wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Well, huh? wait till you hear it, Bob. It's the story of a doctor who changed his personality by concocting a new dope. Yeah, what part do I play? The dope. I, I mean, the, the, the doctor. Uh, that is Dr. Jekyll's friend, Dr. Lanchester. There's a lot of medical terms in the thing, Bob. Do you think you'll be able to handle it okay? Medical terms? Why, well, Frank, I took medicine for three years. You did? What was the matter with you? <laughs> Nothing. Oh. I studied medicine. Oh, well, this will be your dish. Now, I'd like Fanny Bryce to play the part of a patient. I should be very pleased. Yes, uh, carry on. <laughs> yes, and uh, Una Merkel will be my nurse. Yes, carry on, you all. <laughs> Ew! No, 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 no. <laughs> There's no part for you this week, Meredith. You... Oh, gee. <laughs> well, come on, let's let's start. Well, now wait a minute. We'll have to fix one thing. Una's name in the sketch is Miss Q, and we'll have to change it. Why? Well, she's a nurse, and every time I want her to help me, I can't holler, <laughs> Nurse you. <laughs> well, I'm worse than my nephew. All no, right, no, no. let's begin. Well, all right, Bob. The scene is the office of Dr. Jekyll, a fashionable London physician. Dr. Lanchester, his dear friend, is paying him a visit in his laboratory. Joe, Jekyll, I'm glad I found you in. Well, sit down, old boy. Have a spot of arsenic. Thank you. Two months, please. Uh, I ran across a case of subacute lymphuria at the hospital this morning, and I gave the patient your prescription. Subacute lymphuria? You mean three minims of pulverized Latavia Orientalis? Yes. Wasn't oh. that the prescription you used on your patient? Right, Tal. Well, mine died. So did mine. <laughs> Have another spot of arsenic, old pill. Thank you. Lemon, please. I say, Jekyll, old chap, you're looking a bit pinched. Was I? I mean, am I? Well, I've been working rather hard in my lab. You know, chemistry and all that sort of rock. What? I mean, <laughs> right now, uh... Right now, I'm working on a chemical thing which would change me into a sort of a stuff and scare the living you-know out of you or something, I think. Yeah, well, it's the first time I've ever heard the details. What is it, a formula? Yes, it's a formula that brings out my lower nature, if you can imagine such a thing. Heaven, is there any warning symptom? Well, I begin to sneeze violently. Then my outer shape begins to alter. Soon I'm a monster. Then what? Well, then I must imbibe my reverse formula to bring myself back to normal thing. Oh, my poor chap. What a dreadful calamity. You said it. Oh, Dr. Jekyll. Yes, nurse. A patient to see you, a lady. Oh, well, better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. <laughs> what, Lanchester? Bring her in, nurse. Yes, doctor. This way, please, her lady. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Emily Dobbs, my husband is Lord Dobbs, CCB. If all, she is. A WCH. <laughs> We live at number 26 Crumbly Square, Mugget Lane, Street Gate, WC1. Our county seat is Foxton, Grafton Head. Oh, well, delighted, me lady. We're from Duncombe, Maxwell House. Gentlemen, <laughs> please. Yes, for the last few uh, days. Just a moment, just a moment. I can diagnose her case without looking. Her ladyship is suffering from diastasis of the paragastrium, complicated by an involvement of the fifth delph or ganglion. Uh, what's that? Well, in plain English, my lady, my colleague means that you are suffering from intercostal splenetic and do flamingo of the vasculatory thrombosis. Oh, uh, that's different. Uh, why didn't he say that? Uh, are you satisfied? Uh, yes, I feel better already. I wish I could say the same. <laughs> oh, oh, shouldn't I? Good heavens, Jekyll, you say? Yes, I shall have to take my potion. Uh, what's the matter? Is he bomb, eh? Where are my acids? Where's my Bunsen burner? You're sitting on... I thought it was hot in here. Ah, oh, here. Hmm, how I love to tiptoe among my test tubes. 
I wish I knew what was in these half bottles. Careful, Jekyll. Those are the nitrates. Aha. Uh-huh. What do you know about nitrates? Well, they're cheaper than D-rates. Uh, yes. <laughs> I take a sniff of this bottle. Mmm, my nose dropped off. <laughs> Good heavens. How will he smell? Mmm, have I got an answer for that? <laughs> Ah, here's the PC bottle. It's labeled sulfuric acid H2SO4. Now changed to Bryant 97800. <laughs> I'll mix a little of this with a little of that, a dash of bitters. I'll use the drip grind, now the chlorate, the hydrocyanic acid, Paris green, and now I taste it. Mmm, needs more sugar. It's powerful and heavy with evil. Do you know what this is, milady? It sounds rather like a Mickey Finn. <laughs> Lanchester, taste it. No. Taste it, I say. Mm. Taste a little more, Lanchester. No, thanks. I'm dead. <laughs> Good. Now I drink it myself. Here goes. Uh, down the hatch. <laughs> ah, this drink was supposed to cure me, but look what's happening. I'm turning into Mr. Hyde. My hair is growing matted. My nails are lengthening. My face is twisted into an inhuman shape. My fangs are sprouting. Uh, you're what? Fangs, fangs. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to kill you, Lady Dogsworth. I'm going to tear you limb from limb. <laughs> you seem to help me now. I'll kill you too. Do you see the horrible change that's come over me? What change? I'm a murderer. Just a minute, Mr. Morgan. I'll kill you, too. Hey, who is this guy? You can't do a horror sketch on this network. My dear man, would you tamper with a classic? Classic, smash it, you tone it down, or off it goes. Must we make Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde the story of a tea party? That's exactly what I suggest. Well, all right, then, all right. Come on, Taylor, you aren't dead anymore. I'm not? Well, that's fine. What do we do now? Well, from now on, it's a bridge game. Will you have a little poison lemonade, Lady Dodsworth? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, nurse, a little poison lemonade. Oh, yes, Mr. Hyde. I think you look just lovely in your fangs. Do you? <laughs> Thank you. I've been too hard. I've been too hard. I've been forced to Have a little poison lemonade, Doctor. Thank you. Mm, good. Uh, what happened? Hey, Dr. Lanchester dropped dead again. Well, he wouldn't have made four speeds anyway. <laughs> well, what shall we play now? What about dominoes? <laughs> If we do play dominoes, Mr. Hyde, we'll have to make it two-handed. Your nurse gets tough song. Splendid! Have some more poison lemonade. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm afraid I'm dying too, Mr. Hyde. Oh, must you go? I'm afraid I must. Confound it. I wish I hadn't poisoned Lanchester. I want to get a prescription from him. Uh, my dear Mr. Hyde, yes. when I get to heaven, I'll ask him for it. Oh, but suppose he's not in heaven. Oh, uh, then you ask him. <laughs> and now, Ted Pearson, I guess it's about time for you to stand up and deliver. Thank you, Robert. Yes, it's my turn to say something about Maxwell House coffee. You see, friends... Hi, Ma- boys. What are you all doing? I'll take a slice of whatever you're cutting. <laughs> Hello, you know why we were just going into a bit of a jam station over Maxwell House Coffee, Ted Pearson conducting. Well, suppose you move over, boys. I reckon I can sit in there myself. You got a spare horn, I'll blow some your way. Move right in, you and I. Uh, you mean... Uh... Yes, I mean, if you'll step down, I'll step up. Yes, mister, I'll talk. About uh, Maxwell House Coffee? Ted, you're intuitive. You're clairvoyant. You're Delphic. You're, well, you're Ted Pearson. Of course I mean about Maxwell House. Una, the floor is yours. Well, seriously, Ted, if you expect me to tell you that we use Maxwell House coffee down home in Covington, Kentucky, and that my mother used Maxwell House and my grandmother before her, well, I'll just have to say I don't know. But I suspect they may have because we're Southerners and we like good living. But honestly... I can't remember noticing what coffee I was drinking until I began serving Maxwell House here. I liked it and started using it in our home. I'm uh, even getting to be a little bit of a bore on the subject, telling my friends here in Hollywood what a marvelous tasting coffee Maxwell House is. And you know, Ted, as I go places around Beverly Hills, I notice that lots of these friends of mine have been catching on. Ah, thank you, Yuna. You know, you always were known for speaking out in class, and you've gone and done it again. Yes, friends, more and more people, as Una Merkel says, have been catching on. And if you haven't tried Maxwell House lately, then discover for yourself its new, rich, rare flavor. 
Why don't you discover, as Una Merkel puts it, what a marvelous taste in coffee Maxwell House is. <laughs> Now we take you to our concert hall, where tonight, Meredith continues his series of the ten most beloved musical compositions in their respective fields. Musicians tune up. Meredith ascends the podium, raps for attention, raises his baton, and we hear the most favored operatic aria ever written, the Toreador song from Carmen. Carmen. <laughs> gentlemen, mark next Thursday on your calendars right now for an extra special good news program. You surely won't want to miss it because next week we're going to welcome Judy Garland back home after her triumphal personal appearance tour. If you read Life magazine, you'll know already that while Judy was appearing in Columbus, Ohio, she was made the official sweetheart of Sigma Chi by the Sigma Chi chapter at Ohio State University. And next week she'll sing this famous fraternity song on our program. Also, we're going to present another of those sketches you all seem to like so much. If men behaved in barbershops as women do in beauty parlors. We'll have an all-star cast with Maureen O'Sullivan, John Beale, and Sam Levine, brilliant stage comedian of Three Men on a Horse and Room Service. Plus our regular cast of favorites headed by Fanny Bryce, Frank Morgan, Hanley Safford, and Meredith Wilson. Remember that your ticket of admission is just your loyalty to Maxwell House Coffee. Be sure to listen in next Thursday. In the meantime, go to the movies and take the family with you. This is Bob Taylor saying good night. Heard on tonight's program, where I love to whistle from Mad About Music, Can't I from Right This Way, Gypsy in My Soul from 5050. This is Ted Pearson saying good night and good luck for the makers of Maxwell House. The coffee that's always good to the last drop. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony Incorporated, California distributor of Packard Motor Cars. Sir.